matter. I to get it done here. Something the only else. way it'd be any better, you know, not worry about money if there's some Carter money behind behind. It's a guarantee there is. <laughs> We're going to go ahead and go back in session, and our next item is uh, Greg Bischoff is going to talk about the paving program. Greg. Good evening, Mayor, Council. Happy to be here. And uh, we're going to continue the transportation theme. This time, though, we're going to talk about streets. And uh, more to the point, we're going to talk about repaving and rehabilitation of streets. And so to that end, what you see there uh, on the screen are some blue lines and some orange lines. And those are public streets within the uh, corporate limits of the city of Jacksonville. In the blue lines, they are the streets and roads that are maintained by the North Carolina Department of Transportation. There's about uh, 59 miles of those streets in the city, and those are the streets that are streets and roads that North Carolina Department of Transportation fills the potholes, does the patches, repaves the streets, takes care of cleaning out the catch basins. That, those are their streets. And they include such streets as Western Boulevard, North Marine, uh, South Marine, Lejeune Boulevard, Target Street, and, and several others. And the orange streets, those are city streets. Those are the streets that we in the city are responsible for. We do the same thing. We, we fill the potholes, we patch them, uh, we repave them, we rebuild them if we need to, we clean the catch basins to make the water drain off of them, and there are about 154 miles of those streets in the city. And so with uh, all those streets that we're responsible for, quite naturally we get a lot of questions from our citizens. So tonight what we're going to do is we're going to go through a few of the frequently asked questions uh, by the citizens to sort of talk about our repaving and rehabilitation program. And the one question that we get the most is how does a street get selected for repaving or rehabilitation? Or more to the point, when are you going to pave the street in front of my house? And Basically, what it comes down to is the, the condition of the street. Streets are selected based upon their condition. You may remember that we talked about this in January and we showed you this figure. And what this figure basically says is that we rate our streets based upon the number, type, and severity of stresses in the street to include potholes, cracks, uh, patches, we put all that in a big hopper and then we come up with a score for the street. And as you can see, those numbers translate to what we call the A through E streets, with the A being the very best and the E being the failed, very poor streets. And we'll talk a little bit more about, uh, in just a moment, how, how a street actually, we get down to the finer point of selecting the streets that we're going to do. But before we do that, we'll talk about how we address these streets. What do we do? Well, the streets, we break them down into two types of projects. One type of project is performed by our streets maintenance division. They do repaving projects. And what I want to say about repaving versus rehabilitation is repaving is basically a project where you just more or less go out and you overlay the street. There may be some work. It's not typically as intensive as one where we do rehabilitation, where streets may do a little bit of milling, take some of the top layer of the pavement off. They may do a little uh, repair of a few potholes, but then they just basically pave it. The other type of project we do are capital improvement projects. We also, through the capital improvement plan, do some paving uh, more this in recent years than in past. But we also take streets that are, you remember the D and E streets that are failed, and we rehabilitate those streets. We bring it back to life, if you will. Uh, we do that through uh, a couple of different ways. In the, uh, several years ago, the way we did that was we dug those streets out and completely rebuilt them from the base on up. We put the stone down and the pavement on top of it. More, in more recent years, what we've done is that we have, uh, we have 
gone through a process where we grind the street up, we mix in some cement, we wet it and we compact it, and we end up with a base that's sort of like a concrete slab, and then we put concrete on top of that. And that is uh, cheaper than the old way of rebuilding it from the ground up, but it's still very expensive. So that's the two ways that you know we, we deal with our streets. It's through the uh, operating budget uh, of Johnny's crew, and it's through our capital improvements project. And again, our, our streets division, they, they focus, we're back to the question, you know, how does the street get selected? Well, our streets d division focuses on the C streets, the fair streets, and for lack of a better description, <coughs> they start sort of at the bottom of the list, the worst C's, the ones with the lowest numbers that are still in the C, and they try to tick them off by each year doing a few. And again, what they do is they repave. They may do a little bit of repairing of the street, and then after that they repave it. When it comes to capital projects, prior to 2013, what we did was we tackled all the, the E's and D's, the bad streets. We did what I just described, full reconstruction in earlier years, and more recently we did the turning the bay, grinding the street up and mixing in the cement and creating a, a new base. Um, more recently, that being called pavement reclamation. Again, we did that up until about 2013. That was our focus on those type of projects, very expensive projects, and you'll see that in a little later. Since 2013, when it comes to our um, capital projects, what we've decided is that we want to throw in some C streets, maybe limit our capital project to one to two of the worst streets, with the, with the reasoning being is that we're going to extend the life of the C streets. We're going to address more C streets so that hopefully they never make it to D&E where we have to spend a whole lot of money. or it's going to take a while for them to get there. And so that's what we've been doing since 2013. So back to the answer to the question is how does my street get selected? When it comes to uh, the streets, we do C streets. We try to pretty much start at the bottom of the list and each year tick some off. <laughs> and then when we do a capital project, we throw in one or two of the worst projects and attack those. And so that's the answer to the question is the street is selected based upon its rating. We concentrate on the, the fair streets starting at the bottom of the list and then we work on some of the really bad streets. And it all comes down to the rating of the street. So with that, you know, the question becomes where does the, the money come from for repaving and rehabilitation of the city streets? Well, all of the funds that we use come from what's called the State Street Aid Allocation or the Powell Bill Allocation. And the Powell Bill Allocation, the money for Powell Bill, comes to us each year from the state. And the state gets their money from a tax on fuels, fuels that are used to power vehicles on the highway. And so they get a big pot of money and what they do is 75% of it goes uh, into a fund where the distribution is based upon population and 25% of it goes into one, uh, the, the pot that's based upon a distribution based upon road mileage. And so what happens is, you know, that we get our prorate a share, pro share of the population based funds. So, you know, we're in there with all the other cities and their populations. And so the ones with, you know, lesser populations get a little bit less than us and we get a little bit more. And then we're in there in the fund with the road mileage and our 154 miles gets us more money than say somebody who has 100 miles. And what all that translates to is that we get about $1.8 million per year from the state for road related things. And that money has to be used for streets, bikeways, greenways, or sidewalks 
in the city, within the corporate limits. It's for maintaining, repairing, constructing. We can use those funds for that. Well, with that, now that we know where the money comes from, the next question is, well, how much do we spend each year for street repaving and rehabilitation? Well, the streets division, again, who does the, a lot of the repaving, they allocate roughly $315,000 per year to uh, street infrastructure, I think is what the line item is called. And out of that line item, that's where they do their repaving work. They don't use all that 315000 because some of it goes to such things as, as crack sealing, repairing potholes, things like that. But they try to maximize as much or use as much as they can towards repaving. Then in the capital project side of the house, we typically in the recent years, we get anywhere, we've gotten anywhere from roughly 750000 uh, to a million dollars per year allocated to the capital improvement side of the house. Plus, each year, if we've, if we've had a, a capital project, street capital project in the prior year, we bid it out, the bids came in a little less than the money we'd allocated, and we don't use that, we'll roll that into the next year and we'll add that to the, our yearly allocation. So now, you know, the next logical question is, well, okay, you, you use that much money, but what does it cost to repave or rehabilitate one mile of city street? Well, the paving part, again, that's more, that's sort of representative of the mill and overlay uh, category there. That's where we, the mill is where we might go in and shave a little bit of the pavement, old pavement off, get the roughness off, and then we'll overlay it with, with uh, asphalt. Based upon the project, uh, capital project we completed not so long ago, it, when you did run the numbers, a mile of street milling and overlaying was about $225,000. When we take a street and we do the concrete stabilization, you know, build that concrete base, that's costing about $780,000 a mile. And remember, you know what our allocation is anywhere from 750,000 to a million a year so you can sort of see why when it comes to capital projects we want to think a little bit more about preserving instead of attack doing nothing but attacking the DNE streets so another question that we get you know now that we know how much it costs and where the money comes from is how many miles of streets does the city expect to repave or rehabilitate each year? And the answer is it depends. Uh, again, it depends on the funding available. Uh, it also depends if, you know, we're doing one, say, E Street and, you know, we're doing a short block, then we can, you know, that's an expensive thing to do. We can do a lot more streets uh, the C streets if we do that short block versus if we do a long section of E Street where you know where we've spent maybe uh, $500,000 doing a, a short section just to do a short E Street all of a sudden we're doing $650,000 because we're doing a longer E Street um, you know it, it, it that influences how many miles we can do in a year our goal is our goal is try to, to try to do between the streets division and the capital projects though is three to five miles per year. Of course, remember we have 154 miles of streets, um, but you know that's the, the funding that's available for us from the Powell bill. So how have we been doing in in recent years? Um, what you'll see there is uh, we in fiscal, if you add fiscal 13, 14 together between streets and us, it's a little less than uh, uh, than three miles. We were at 2.7 miles, but this year's projects, we're expecting to do more than 3.4 uh, miles worth of streets between the two types of uh, projects. So 
And then another question we get is, <coughs> why are some of the streets that are listed in the CIP, let's say I've got the FY15 CIP book, and I look, and in uh, FY17, uh, Bordeaux Street is listed as a street to be done, but when FY17 rolls it around, Bordeaux Street has disappeared and it's not done or it's been moved out. Why does that happen? Well, to, to answer that, I, I have to take you through a little bit of the process of the CIP when it comes to streets. The way the CIP process works for streets is that streets rates the streets and they provide us with a 10-year list of streets that uh, they propose for repaving or rehabilitation. The engineering division then gets that and as the streets start coming into focus as we get to the action year if you will we start looking at the the streets in in great detail uh, what we'll do is we will go out and we'll walk the streets and uh, sometimes when we're out there what we'll, we'll do is we'll walk a little bit further and we'll say well you know, we should go ahead and do this additional segment of this street uh, instead of just this segment. And sometimes when we say that, that means that we might need to delay the street for another year or so to be able to do that larger section. What I'll say though is, particularly in FY15, instead of saying that, what we've said is, we think we have enough money, so let's go ahead and do this segment. This segment to us looks similar to the segment we're going to do and we do uh, one of the other things that we've started doing is doing geotechnical investigations to sort of back up our assessment we started doing that last year on each one of the projects that enter the CIP so a street may be moved out because we're doing a, a larger segment sometimes we actually expand the scope of the project at a given location Another thing that we do as the streets come into focus is we will um, video, we'll, we'll order up videos of the sewers at those streets. We want the camera to go in, look at those sewers, see if we have problems. We in engineering talk with uh, the utilities maintenance section, uh, ask them are there, are there problems along the street? Is there a history of repairs? Do we need to be thinking about replacing the water lines? And in some cases the answer is yes. And in some cases, we're able to get those utility repairs taken care of before the streets actually get come up for paving. Some cases, they're not. So what we have to do is we have to wait for those streets for the utility repairs to be made. So they may have been moved out of, uh, moved on to another year because of that. But they're typically still on the schedule somewhere, but just for an outlying year. And then again, sometimes, uh, again, we do the geotechnical report, we do walkovers, and uh, our observations backed up by the geotechnical report, sometimes we say, we think this street can wait. The geotechnical report will tell us, you know, there is a pretty good base down here. It's a thick base. The asphalt's thick. Uh, it may be cracked near the top and not look so great, but it's still structurally got some life to it. So we may move it off and move one in that uh, we think might need uh, uh, be more deserving of work. And, and the, the advantage, you know, the way our streets division <coughs> works is they go out and they rely on observations, but we actually get geotechnical information once it comes into focus to help us make sure, yeah, the street really mm -hmm. needs to be done. But, you know, what I'll, I'll say is, you know, I've, I've sort of talked about <laughs> streets that get moved out that don't show up when you think they're going to show up, but, you know, uh, we also often move a bunch of streets in. For example, uh, we have right now out for bid our FY Street, FY15 Street Rehabilitation Project. These are the streets that are listed in the uh, capital improvement plan, the FY15 uh, capital improvement plan, as the streets that we're going to do. Well, we're actually adding in FY16 streets because we went out, did our evaluations, decided what we were doing to the streets, got a, what we think is a good feel what the cost is going to be, and we said we're going to have money left over. Let's pull these FY16 streets in. 
So this year's FY15 street <coughs> rehabilitation project actually includes the FY16 streets, plus it adds one more East Thompson Street. This is the case, in the case of East Thompson, this is the case where we went to, um, uh, I can't remember the, the adjacent street, uh, Lloyd. East Thompson is more or less an extension of Lloyd. Lloyd uh, and East Thompson are very similar in appearance and in um, their subsurface, the base, the subgrade are very similar. So we said if we're going to do Lloyd, we might as well do East Thompson Street while we're here. It, it only makes sense. So we added in East Thompson Street. And here's another one that we get. Uh, why is part of a street repaved instead of the whole street? You know, up to this point, I've been saying we're repaving or rehabilitating a street. Well, what we actually do is we rehabilitate or we repave parts of streets. And the reason we do that is because our streets are graded from intersection to intersection. So in other words, um, out here on Newbridge, Newbridge would have a, a, a grade from Johnson Boulevard to Bayshore. And then from Bayshore to Hearth would ha might have a different grade. It's not unusual that you might not have a, a, B, a, a B section right adjacent to a C or a D section. And we're certainly not going to work on the B section because that's a good section. So what we'll do is we will do the section of the okay. street that has the uh, lower rating and leave alone the good part of the street. This is a question that we get. Why do I sometimes see pavement patches at recently paved or rehabilitated streets? Well, <laughs> um, ah, there it is. Those patches come about because occasionally, even despite our best efforts, we might get a localized area where we get a little, we get a soft spot and our almost new pavement starts cracking because it's giving away underneath and we have to repair those. That tends to be uh, rare, but it does happen. Usually what happens is more the case is that there's a water line or a sewer line break and we have to go fix it and patch it. But again, we try to do everything we can to avoid that from happening. Again, remember I say we go inspect the sewers, we review history repairs, we talk to internally about are there problems there so that we can try to go and fix those things before, you know, we pave. And, you know, we try, but, you know, it, it just happens. Sometimes, you know, the water line's going to break and, you know, other cities, DOT, they have the same problems. Uh, if you know a way to keep it from happening, we'd love to hear it because we don't like the patches either. So um, with that, those are a few of the frequently asked questions. Those are the ones that are asked more often and, you know, certainly I'll be willing to entertain any of your questions. Uh, <clears throat> do you have a feel for are we gaining on the D's and E's? Are, are more of the C's slipping into there than what we can get to? Where, where do you think we are as far as uh, staying on top, catching up, falling further behind? What do you think? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let Johnny chime in, but I, I think we are gaining on the D's and E's. Um, but, you know, over the long haul, I think we're probably falling behind some because remember, we have 154 miles of streets and we're doing, you know, our goal is three to maybe five miles a year. At that rate, we're talking anywhere from 31 to 50 some years to get to touch every street in the city. Not that they're all going to get bad, but it's, it's, it's a slow process relative to the street mileage we have. 
we concentrated in the past on surface treatments, whether it was crack sealing, slurry pavement, chip seal, any kind of product that was in the market that was good for our streets, we tried a few of them. And they worked at that time, but then we found out that in 2013, I asked for a little more money to double up on asphalt. We went into asphalt overlays. Since then, there's been three to four additional miles done by just us at Streets Division, the small crew that we have down there. So we've added to that failure rate by increasing the C streets all the way back up to a B or an A. And naturally, it's probably an A once you've overlaid it. But the idea right now was to look at those streets. We can't do a D and E without a lot of effort on our part. So those are passed to Greg's people, and they do the D's and E streets, the worst ones, if you will. So we'll concentrate on the C's, and we've done that since 2013. And I think we've made a big headway toward increasing the mileage of new streets, newer streets now. And increasing their life expectancy. So, so the mileage of the D and E streets have not increased? Not a lot. Not a lot. We still only are getting two or three a year at this rate. But none have failed. The idea was to keep the C's up. Right, you're doing the work so C's so they don't fall That load is not bigger. It right. is getting smaller, but not at a rate that we'd like. Yes. Good. We can we can give you we can show you what our latest pavement evaluation scores are, and probably some indication of what they were previously. But you know we still when you think about it if you if you say for example that an overlay when you put it on a street would be good for 15 years, okay, before you needed to go back and say do do another significant maintenance activity. That means that 15 years divided into 154, that's 10 miles a year, you know, to keep sort of at pace. Right, and we're, we're doing a third of that. Yeah, so I mean, I think we're still, we still got room to go, uh, but hopefully, uh, you know, our, our, you know, by doing more like this, we are at least keeping them from going down and we're, we're managing them at a higher level, but they still we, probably need a little yeah, more work. It sounds like we, we really we need to find more, more funding for the roads. Um, we briefly talked about uh, during the budget process uh, some, some fees that would be able to be used for, uh, for road maintenance. Um, is that something that you all are going to be bringing back to us? Yes, I think we, we definitely want to have more more discussions on that, especially as we look. Well, we can certainly we don't have to wait, uh, you know, until budget to implement. Right, fees, you're allowed yes. to to implement that during yes. a non-budget time. Yes, yes, <coughs> certainly, certainly want to have more discussions on that because just like the state, you know, road maintenance we'll is a challenge. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we probably hear more. I mean, I, I'm assuming they do. I hear more about road complaints than than most. I mean, either drainage or roads is generally mostly what we hear. Well, and that's what we heard at our summit. You know, the, the concern about neighborhoods not being, you know, taken care of, you know, the older neighborhoods. And that. But, uh, but I think we, you know, I think our process has been refined fairly well. So I think we, we've got a, a good process in place now with this, you know, overlay kind of maintenance activity. Now it's a question of, okay, what are we really ready to commit, you know, in the way of funding? And obviously, because we can't control the Powell Bill, and, you know, if you listen to some of the, the changes that get proposed in the legislature, you know, there's changes that could make Powell Bill funding less, you know, which then would even put a bigger burden on our local uh, tax base. But yes, we'll be, we'll be glad to, to have additional discussions about where could we, you know, come up with additional funding. But let me give you one last comment, if I may, on the D and E streets. Well, I have a list of those, and the percentage that we had reported years gone by, but that percentage is it's gone down to about maybe ten percent. It is a small amount. If you looked at this at this list compared to the A B C streets you'll see that it's a very small piece of pie in that round circle. It's very, very small. So I think we'll knock that out within the next five or seven <coughs> years. Really, we'll make a big, big dent in it. 
which doesn't help if you're living on a D or an E street. No, uh, it doesn't. It's, you look out your window and wonder when they're going to fix it. Yes, sir. And I heard more comments on the patch on Doris Avenue than, than any, <laughs> probably any patch in, uh, in Jacksonville, so. Yes, sir. You get, you get to drive, drive by it all the time, too, right? Yeah. That was that's where the water line busted, right? We yeah, had right the sewer right there, right there, the Vernon, line. Vernon, and, and Doris, and yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. It, 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 we 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 sometimes think that the sheer act of you know Doing repaving a street with the vibrating, particularly when we do we we do the uh, the reclamation projects with, where we grind up, that it it sort of shakes those sure. those lines sure. apart, sure. and then after a period of time they just come apart and uh, that's a hard thing to predict. Anybody else? Thank you guys, appreciate it. Thank you. The next item we have up for tonight is the police department has, uh, we'll talk to us about body cameras, other recording devices, Chief Gennaro will present of course. Thank Chief, you, Mayor. I appreciate yours. it. Appreciate it. I think uh, the first thing we kind of talk about is because body cameras are relatively new for police, one of the things I think is we have to answer a number of questions. And over the last uh, three or four months, actually we've had body cams, our, our camera systems for the last 10 years. I think the mayor was, uh, was on the police department when they purchased those first in-car cameras. We've also had taser cameras. So we've had a number of, of cameras that are attached to the taser. When the officer pulls out his taser, activates it, the camera would come on. Now there's a number of uh, issues with those taser cams and we'll talk a little bit about those, especially when we get to the video. But these are some of the questions that we, that we have to answer. Um, who and what should be recorded? When does the officer turn on the camera? When do they turn it off? Are there any exemptions to the uh, recording? How will the video be stored, which is a big issue that we'll talk about in just a few minutes and who has access to that video, when and how these videos will be released to the public, and the privacy issues that are involved. So I think we'll, we'll kind of start out and talk a little bit about the perception because um, part of the reason that uh, many police departments are looking for at body cams is because of the public per perception that the police use force, and it, it continues to be a concern do we use force too much? Just to talk a little bit about Jacksonville, <coughs> we had about 74,000 contacts with, uh, with citizens over the last year. We had 4,000 some arrests. We had 48 use of force complaints or use of force incidents and five use of force complaints. <coughs> that transit transitions into point zero zero six of all our contacts. Now why is that important? If we look at what the nation is, no, nationwide the statistics show that uh, use of force among contacts is about 1.4 percent. So we're at point zero 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 six percent. So we're significantly under what the national standard looks like. <coughs> But I think that, uh, you know, I've been talking a little bit about those cameras. In fact, I sent you two documents. The first document is, is what the uh, North Carolina Chiefs of Police have came, came up with. And there was a meeting of about 60 chiefs, and we had some discussion about, these do about, uh, about the issues that were going on in our country. So they came up with this document, and I think, I think it's important for us to understand that the camera is really part of a larger strategy. And I think number one is that we as the police and, and the training issues, the mayor's heavily involved with that with the college, is we need to re-engineer the way we do use of force training. Right now we do use of force training that's basically in, in stovepipes. We teach them the law about use of force. We teach them about how to, how to address mentally uh, mentally challenged people. We talk about other different types of that de-escalation, but we talk about those in kind of a separate, separate parts of our class and separate parts of our training. I think one of the things that we have to do is we have to start looking at how we train those, and I think we're going to be moving toward more scenario-based training. 
we do quite a bit of scenario based training um, now but I think that needs to be more of a part of how we how we retrain and how we train initially uh, the police officers the other thing that we that we need to really focus on is de-escalation training we do de-escalation training what we do is we monitor uses of forces so if an officer even though he's he's within our policy even though he was justified in using force a lot of times what we'll do is we'll look over the year and we'll see certain officers who had more use of force than others we'll send those officers to de-escalation training and that has been highly effective in, in, in our ability to reduce those use of forces. Now we think that, that this de-escalation training needs to be more generalized and more focused on all the police officers. And, and over the next year we, we're going to be looking at that. The other thing that we've already worked with or working with the college is fair and impartial policing. Fair and impartial policing is a, is a course of study that kind of teaches people how to be more fair and impartial, how to deal with biases, but more important when they go out on, on the scene is not to have those biases that, that, that they bring. And, and I think that's really important when you talk about, you know, the officer may get to the scene and initially he may say, you know, somebody may tell him that so-and-so stole that, immediately he may change the way he interacts with that person. And this training is, is something that, uh, that we think is important because we think that we can reduce those biases and be, have a more fair and impartial um, encounter. Now this, this training will be starting in January and, and actually we're partnering with the college to bring that training here. It's, it's, in, it's in high demand. It was developed by the uh, Department of Justice about a, a year ago and since then it's been uh, being taught all over the country. The other thing I think that we do is we have CIT officers, crisis intervention trained officers, and they're specially trained officers who go out and deal with mentally challenged individuals. We've asked RHA, the provider of mental health in our community, to bring more of those classes there because we think dealing with uh, mentally challenged individuals is a large part of where we have to use force. And if we can train them more uh, in this crisis intervention training, which is which is more of that de-escalation and how to how to how to appropriately uh, manage those kinds of individuals, we think we can also reduce those forces. So, even though the cameras the cameras can be important, we think that it's part of a larger strategy, and we wanted to talk a little bit about that that type of strategy. <coughs> The other thing is, do the cameras actually work? Do they actually reduce, um, reduce it? And there's been really no formal study that's been published at this time. Now we, um, we, we know a lot from, from in-car cameras, because we've had in-car cameras for, for years and they've been very effective. About 97% of the time, the, the officers we were able to resolve those complaints. Um, using the in-car cameras. So a lot of the complaints that we get about traffic stops, about, about different things, are the in-car cameras give us enough information to resolve that. Now we added the taser cams about five years ago and um, with, with, with our, our idea was to have those cameras available when an officer uses the taser. And what we found is that the, inf the information leading up to the event was never on the taser cam because the officer draw the taser cam and turned it on the camera would activate and we would get the tasing incident not what what led up to that so I, I think that part of our discussion or part of our evaluation is to phase out those taser cams because they are at the at the point of, uh, of, of changing them out and go with some type of body cam and, and the in-car cameras, I, you know, even though there's no, no, no hard study, I've, I firmly believe they increase accountability, they reduce the complaints, they save a lot in court costs, they lower the overtime for investigations because it's right on the, on the video. Um, in fact, the last three officer-involved shootings have all been on video. We've had, we've had the entire incident on video. So 
So that cut down our investigation time. It was it was very helpful for the DA and the SBI to actually see the entire incident. Now, there's a number of challenges. First is the cost. And and the cost is is you know, depending on, you know, Charlotte spent two million dollars for uh, body cams for every officer in Charlotte. They're spending a million dollars per year just for the storage of that information. So the cost is something that we really have to look at and we really have to consider. The privacy issues. Now in your uh, in your packet I've provided a copy of our, our new our policy. That, that the information that Mike's making reference to has actually been downloaded in I legislate. So you can just and, draw it down from my legislature. And this is this is best practices across the nation. We implemented this policy, and actually, we changed some of our in-car camera video policy based upon some of the best practices. So we have a policy in place because we have body cams, and we're we're actually testing three different types of body cams. But if if anybody wants a, a Printed copy, just let us know and we'll I, be glad I, to I put got, one in your box. I got one right now if you need it. Has Calias come out with a, with a stance on it? Well, Calias yeah. says that we will have a, a policy. It does, there's, there's some bullets that have to be met, and this policy meets all those bullets. So the other thing I think is, you know, the privacy issue that we have to talk about, defining what our policy is, the storage of the data, and the public records request. In California, we're a lot of agencies have implemented that they've been inundated with public records requests and if you can think of an officer on a 12-hour shift if he's if he some 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 officers keep it on the entire 12-hour shift that's a lot of data to go through so privacy issues and how we release it and how we handle those public records requests are something that I think uh, from the state standpoint uh, in fact there's a bill that's going to restrict it and um, and 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 main and not make it public record um, right now in the legislature, and we think that's gonna that's gonna be effective because if we had to do public records requests, it would be a very difficult process. We have 98 patrol officers, officers that are assigned to some type of patrol function, whether they're traffic, community officers, or whatever, that are probably wearing body cams. And if they're, if they're collecting that data, that's a lot of data that would have to be sifted through on a public records request. And the camera evaluation is something that we're going through now. So we, we think that this needs to be a slow process. We think we really need to evaluate what kind of camera, how the camera interacts with our in-car cameras. Because, uh, you know, if we're using that camera as a... Uh, as part, I would not advocate getting rid of the in-car cameras because the in-car cameras give us a different perspective. And I think that's the important part when we talk about the cameras. And when you see the videos, some of the test video that we have, these cameras are a different perspective than you'll see from somebody videotaping the event or, or a surveillance video or an in-car camera. They're not near as effective as an in-car camera. So um, we, we, we're, we've been looking at a number of different kinds. We've been evaluating those. And we'll show you a little bit of the video in just a minute. You know, the preliminary costs, these are the preliminary costs right now. This cost doesn't include some of the software. But, I mean, this is kind of where we're at right now. We're looking at the cost. We're talking with our ITS folks because our ITS folks are concerned about the amount of data that we store on those uh, on the server. We used to store all of our in-car cameras and we kept those videos for a year. And we had to go away from that. Now we keep them based upon the state, state code or the state records retention. We keep them for 30 days. And that, that would give somebody enough time to complain or whatever and then to pull up that video or review it for evaluation process. What's the cost of the storage for our in-car cameras? Well, we're doing that. We're doing that um, in-house. But I can tell you that um, it takes about. Uh, and, I, and Chris is probably going to get mad at me because I said this. But one event 
which it lasts no, normally lasts of those 74,000 encounters we spend about 45 minutes on each of those encounters now some of them are shorter some of them are longer but the average is 45 minutes if you take the amount of data to, to tape it for an in for an in-car camera that's two gigabytes okay now if you take those gigabytes and you start multiplying it out to a terabyte just the just the cost of 30 days of that is probably somewhere around four or five hundred dollars to store that now of course after that 30 days it's rolling over but you know like I said you have 98 patrol officers who are feeding data into that system um, you know for um, for the the taser camera they would they would store that data for us for about twenty seven thousand dollars a year so if if we go with say the taser cam or the digital alley they would store it the difference with WatchGuard is WatchGuard is just paying for the software we have to buy the memory so there's 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 a lot of nuances and a lot of challenges as we look at how we're going to do that whether we're going to do that in-house or whether we're going to contract it out and the the next slide oops the next slide is evidence.com which is one of the contractors that we could um, basically contract with uh, the benefit of that is is they would link the videos together um, say the in-car camera as long as they're the same company the in-car camera and the body cam so that we could you know if, if we're looking for a particular video we could see the in-car camera and we could see the uh, the body cam as well but um, you know there's there's a lot of a lot of questions that we still have about what is the best for us and I think I think this kind of gives you an idea of why it's important these are the three cameras that we've been testing and this is just where uh, where officers are out there and they're looking at the cameras or they're they're pulling their guns they're running with the cameras and you can see each of them has a different kind of perspective you know they're, they're basically doing the same thing but it's it's a different kind of perspective when he pulls his arms up when he's running um, the cameras are very clear and you can see like the digital alley has a special stabilizing function but you also lose clarity in that you don't it's not near as clear as as some of the others so during this evaluation process we're kind of looking at these videos and trying to figure out well you know when we talk about and it's going to switch just in a minute and it's going to go to the low light situations do we need low light situations how much you know because 50 percent of our time is in the dark and and we think that's important that's important as to you know how that how that camera works inside how it's going to work in the dark what um, what it's going to do when we run because the cameras are are only a small part of the picture so this kind of gives you an idea of low light you can see the digital alley it's very difficult to see the axon camera is much much clearer in that low life situation low light situation So we think that it's going to take us some time to continue this evaluation process. Um, on the agenda tonight, there's a there's the grant that uh, that that's we're we're going to apply for that grant. Um, out of the 19,000 um, police agencies, only a few are going to get that grant because it's an evaluation grant. There's a bill in uh, in North Carolina legislature right now that uh, wants to allocate about five million dollars to help buy body cams if that passes then obviously we'll be looking for that um, there's also some federal money that is going to be passed through money that have come through the governor's crime commission but that money we probably won't see until enough till the the cycle starts up again in january of next year so we have money in the budget to to actually purchase those cameras but we're going we're being very slow and methodical about this because you know we, we don't want to invest in uh, you know uh, a camera system that doesn't meet uh, 
meet meet our needs. So I'll be glad to answer any questions. Questions? So I mean, uh, <clears throat> Mike, our plan then is basically apply for this grant mm -hmm. uh, to do a, a demonstration or a test right. from the federal government, which requires an equal match. Yes, it's 50-50 mm -hmm. match. Now we have money, there's money uh, when you approve the budget, you approved money. Uh, we have a third of the cameras this year, a third of the cameras next year, and a third of the cameras the year after. Now, some of that money is, is uh, and it also, we're looking at replacing our in-car cameras because they're at end of life. So a third of those will go this year, and a third next year, and a third the, the year after. Um, the in-car camera, we're still in the evaluation stages of those cameras as well because we're trying to find the best match between the the body cam and the in-car cameras. Thank you. Very yeah. good report. Very nice. Thank you. Anybody got anything else? Well, that will uh, move the adjournment for adjournment. Any motion? Second. All in favor? Aye. Uh -huh. <coughs>